Hey, it's Chuck Dixon welcoming you to another installment of Ask Chuck Dixon, number 50. Hey, if you have questions for Ask Chuck Dixon, you can always send them to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. That's Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. Uh, I see your questions on Facebook. I see your questions right here on YouTube. But the most direct access to me would be this email address, Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. And uh, hey, if you like these uh, videos, think about subscribing. Uh, I, I solicited for subscriptions uh, recently on Facebook, and uh, the results were spectacular. Uh, and in, in a lot of ways, a lot of you did subscribe, and I thank every single one of you. Uh, and the raised subscription number um, increased the viewership on the videos dramatically. Uh, you know, I jumped up in views and jumped up in views on past videos and things like that. So the subscriptions, the thumbs up, the comments, and the sharing, all very much appreciated. Thank you all. Okay, first question. Michael Hutchison. Hey, Hutch. I loved Amigula as a supporting character in Nightwing for the readers, a Batman villain who got an implant freeing him from his ailment and then moved into Dick Grayson's building. I thought you did a great job fleshing him out as a character. I believe you created him. But then you had the story where the villain sabotages his implant and he goes crazy, and then he's never heard from again. Presumably he's back in prison due to his outburst. I thought it a rather tragic end to someone who was a supporting character, even if your entire intention was to set up this plot point. He's a gentle soul undone by someone's evil plans. Did you have anything planned for him if you'd stayed on Nightwing? Um, well, I didn't create Amygdala. Um, I borrowed him. <laughs> Amygdala was a, a, a Batman character created by the ingenious Alan Grant. And, uh, I asked, I, I often borrowed Alan's <laughs> characters because he created some great new villains. Uh, I, lo I love the Rat Catcher and especially love the Ventriloquist. And Amygdala, Amygdala hadn't been used in a while, and I just thought it'd be funny if we cured him and uh, made him, because <laughs> he's this massively huge, monstrous, Hulk like figure. If we just made him uh, Dick Grayson's uh, docile neighbor in Bloodhaven. Uh, and, I, and I asked Alan if I could use him once again uh, because I, I'd written him once before in Detective. And, and Alan, as always, graciously said yes. He was very pleased that I loved his characters enough that I wanted to increase their profile in the Batman universe. I, I think Alan used him quite a few times. Now, for those of you not familiar with Amygdala, uh, Amygdala was a guy um, who had the amygdala portion of his brain removed. And uh, the amygdala is a, is a, I believe, a gland. It's at the top of the, the hypothalamus. Uh, it's at the top of our lizard brain. And what it does is it, it controls emotion. And amygdala's problem was uh, he had no control over his emotions. When he got sad, he was very, very sad. And more dangerously, when he got angry, he got very, very angry uh, and simply couldn't turn it off. So, um, yeah, thank you to Alan Grant, and uh, you're very welcome for the, the, uh, the little science lesson here. <laughs> but an ingenious character, uh, and, and a lot of fun to write, especially as a, as a docile sort of, you know, Herman Munster type, the way I wrote him in Nightwing. Okay, Luke Johnson. In an age where Marvel and DC are obsessed with new legacy characters, why do they insist on creating new ones rather than using the ones that have been built up a fan base and potentially potentially still untapped. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, there's something to be said for creating new characters because you never know what might catch on. And, and you know, sometimes a generation wants their own character. They don't want to, you know, their older brother or their father's character. Uh, but, you know, all of this goes along with the way they've morphed and wafted and mangled <laughs> the iconic characters. They just can't leave anything alone. Uh, they've got to change the familiar to the unfamiliar. They've got to change iconic characters to something more suited to the now, which is always an enormous mistake. 
You do not want to write in the now. Very few writers are um, aware enough of the now to write about it accurately. And certainly that's not anything anyone's looking for in a comic book. You're not looking for social commentary. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that Marvel and DC wishes their readers were looking for social commentary, but they've got the wrong readers. Uh, comic book readers tend to want escapism, and they don't want uh, they don't want to be preached at or held up for mockery or in any way degraded or challenged or shocked. They just want a good story, and they've entirely lost sight of that. Uh, why they've done this? It's because a a uh, group of publishers, editors, and creators who are more politically minded and all of one political mind, a hive mind, have taken over mainstream comics. And there you have it. That's, that's the answer to all those questions. And they've, you know, sidelined uh, any kind of creators or most of the creators who understand the craft, understand the medium, and hired people who really wouldn't have found jobs on a fanzine in the 70s if they'd applied. Okay, Jared Mitchell. Hey, Jared. You don't often write yourself into a comic book story, but when Dixon Taxi Service appeared in Robin 100, it seemed like such a fitting conclusion to your legendary run. How did this scene come about? Was it your idea, or did the artist pay tribute to you? Uh, yeah, it wasn't my idea. I didn't write myself into the comic. Uh, it was, I think, the editor's idea uh, and suggested to the artist. And, um, you know, I, the artwork in this issue was fine, Robin 100, but wow, that's the worst caricature of me ever. It doesn't look like me at all. <laughs> um, I kind of look like a gibbon. <laughs> I've never had a bare chin in my life. Uh, I've always had, a, I've had a mustache since I was 19. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what photo ref they used. Um, my, my suspicion is the editor described me over the phone. <laughs> So, but, you know, um, it was a good thought. I appreciate the effort. You know, um, it was nice. It was nice that they acknowledged that this was my final issue of Robin. And, and I was <laughs> driving myself away in a taxi. Um, and uh, here we have, we have a, a Jared Mitchell twin spin because Jared asks so many questions. And he is my number one fan. It's official. He is my number one fan. Sorry to all the rest of you. Uh, but here we go. Another Jared Mitchell question. Do you remember creating pop sensation Normandy Shields from Robin 97? Her lyrics are still in my head. Well, you poor man. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my made up pop lyrics still in your head. Yeah, issue uh, 97 of Robin was a standalone issue. I think we... We got caught in a uh, in the crossfire of some crossover, and so I had to write a fill-in issue, and it featured Robin uh, acting as unofficial bodyguard for a pop singer named Normandy Shields when she shows up in Gotham, and uh, for some reason there's a whole bunch of crazy people out to kill her, and uh, Robin has to get to the bottom of that mystery while protecting her. And the name Normandy Shields, uh, I, mean, I don't know where I came up with that. I really don't. Okay, Tex Harmon. Have you done an image series? If not, what artist would you hand pick to work with? Also, would you would love to see your take on a short Batman black and white story? Uh, well, you, you, you're going to get your wish on both of them. Yeah, I worked at Image uh, specifically at Wildstorm. I did three different Team 7 uh, miniseries. Uh, the first one with Aaron Wiesenfeld, the second one with Chris Warner, the third one with, I don't remember. He's probably a superstar now, but I, I don't remember the guy's name. Uh, also, Image did the trade paperback of uh, my series Iron Ghost, created by me, uh, Flynn Henry, and Sergio Cariello. Uh, I, I didn't initially do the book for Image. I did it for some uh, company whose name I can't remember. Across the Pond. Across the Pond Comics. And, uh, but for some reason, uh, Image was the one to print the trade paperback. So, yeah, I have worked for Image. And I actually did quite a bit of work for Wildstorm on uh, different titles. Uh, I did Team Zero, which was a Team 7 prequel. And uh, I did the 
the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street comic for them, and a few other things. I think the Snakes on a Plane comic was, was a Wildstorm comic. Um, as far as a, a Batman black and white eight-pager, I've already done one. Um, in the, the initial run of Batman black and white, uh, they sort of slipped me into the collection because um, Mark, I believe, yeah, Mark Chiarello was the editor. And uh, when he put together most of the stories, he realized that he did not have one mystery story in all of the black and white short stories. Uh, every writer chose to write their, you know, ultimate black Batman story and kind of forgot that he's also, you know, a great detective. And so Mark said, uh, you know, we have eight pages to spare. Could you write a Batman mystery story in which he actually works as a detective? And uh, Mark was a huge fan of Jorge Zafino and said, could you convince Jorge Zafino to draw it? And um, I did, and he did, and <laughs> and the rest is history. Uh, but it's a tight little, you know, who done it? Batman solves in eight pages. So uh, look it up. Don Perkage. You sometimes have an artist in mind when you write a story. Do you ever compose a narrative while speaking to an illustrator or with an artist in mind and then find out the artist is unable to do the story? If so, has it led to scenarios where you felt it would have been better if you had the artist you were visualizing when you compose the story? Or has it led to where you were pleased you got the different artist? I am curious if both instances have happened. They probably happened a dozen times in my career. I've gotten to work with some terrific people. Here's Rodolfo DiMaggio. This isn't comics. This is a production painting he did for the movie 13 Days. Um, but I've gotten, you know, just amazing people. You know, Scott McDaniel, Sergio Cariello, uh, Larry Stroman, Flint Henry, uh, Butch Geis, Gary Quapis, uh, my most frequent collaborator, and Graham Nolan, my second most frequent collaborator. So I've been super fortunate with artists. I, I'm not a guy who looks back with regret and says, oh, man, you know, if only I'd gotten this guy or that guy. Uh, you know, I've worked with some of the absolute, I've worked with some legends, you know, and, 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 on the art end. And, uh, you know, just terrific talent. And um, hold on. Why is the phone always ringing over these? I do these live straight through. Um I don't have editing capabilities <laughs> or even interest in doing any editing. These are raw, everyone. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, but there was one instance. Um, I did an issue of what if, <laughs> what if the Silver Surfer had not betrayed Galactus? And I got a, a convention style promise from Ron Friends that he would draw this issue. And he was real interested at a con. And I, I love Ron. Ron's a great guy. And everybody makes promises at conventions that they mean to keep when they say them. But, you know, things happen. And Ron's schedule did not permit him to draw this issue. As much as I begged the editor to hold off until Ron's schedule was clear. And uh, a, a guy named Joe Barney, he, you know, he did a fine job. He did an okay job on the issue. But I really wanted this to be um, Kirby-esque. I really wanted this to be classic Marvel story, and, and Ron would have been absolutely perfect for it. And it's probably my favorite issue of What If that I wrote. I, I think I wrote maybe eight or nine issues of What If. But, um, you know, it's a story about basically if Galactus had succeeded in, uh, you know, consuming the Earth. And uh, the follow-up is that uh, the Fantastic Four ally with Doctor Doom to follow Galactus into space and get revenge for the destruction of our home world. Uh, and boy, I really wish Ron had been able to draw it. So there you go. Uh, one regret in, in 35 years of writing comics. <laughs> J.D. Dishman. I got a question of what you think of the Spin Master's Bane action figure and the Spin Master acquiring DC Boys Toys line license from Mattel, who almost forever had the license since Hasbro Canada lost it in the 2000s. Um, yeah, I don't have any feelings one way or the other. I don't have any control one way or the other. Uh, it's nice to get, you know, it's nice to get a royalty check based on Bane action figures. That's sweet. Um, 
It's nice to see them in the stores. It, it's great to know that Bane is a household name and, um, <clears throat> and that he's a permanent member of the, the Batman Rose Gallery. Uh, here's the toy in question. It's a, it's a massively huge toy. It's a, it's a Batman versus Bane set. I've never heard of the company Spin Masters. I'm a toy guy, too. I like toys. and I've never heard of Spin Masters. Um, I don't even know why they're called Spin Masters. This toy doesn't spin. Uh, so, but, you know, it's it, 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 you know, sort of creditable down market action figures to me. They kind of look like the... They, <clears throat> the construction of them is kind of like the knockoff toys you see at flea markets from imported from China, you know, the, the kind of things like, you know, it'll, it, it's Superman, but he has a red costume and he's called, you know, superior man, the, those kind of action figures. Uh, but you know, it's, it's fun and kids probably had fun with it. Um, there's been a lot of Bane action figures. Here is the legendary shelf of Bane that's in my office that keeps getting added to, added to the point where it has become the shelves of Bane. Uh, I needed an annex to, <laughs> store the rest of them and display the rest of all of the the various Bane action figures and and tchotchkes. I, I love the Pez dispenser. And uh, even with the two shelves of Bane, there's, there's, there's still spillover. I have to arrange them in, in, in other places around the office. But, uh, you know, like I said, I'm a toy guy too. I'm a comic book guy and a toy guy. And to see something I created turned into so many awesome toys and statues and figures and busts and all the rest of it 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 i gotta tell you it's pretty cool it is pretty cool so hope i answered your question uh but yeah i have no control over you know who makes the things or all the rest of it and i'm just fine with you know as long as they keep making them okay raf have you ever listened to the bbc batman nightfall radio drama i discovered it in university a few years back and i would listen to it on my way to other classes and on my breaks I thought it was really well done, and it makes me want more radio drama adaptations of classic stories. Yeah, I, I remember it well. Um, the thing I remember most about it uh, was Mark Hamill played the Joker on it, and uh, he read the credits at the end. So I got to hear my name read by the Joker at the end. And the funniest part in the credits was <clears throat> when he reads off the name uh, Jordan B. Gorfinkel. He just, you know, goes into this giggle fit. <laughs> <laughs> it's hysterical because he, he finds the name Gorfinkel funny. Uh, <clears throat> on that same note, Mark Hamill used to pretty regularly visit the DC Comics offices back in the day because uh, he's a big comic book fan. He's got a huge Golden Age collection. And <clears throat> one time he slipped into Scott Peterson's office when Scott was out and he re-recorded Scott's uh, greeting message for his voicemail. <laughs> somebody, somebody there showed him how to do it. And uh, so you, we, when you called Scott Peterson and he was out of the office, you got this hysterical Mark Hamill as the Joker voicemail message. And um, it became so popular that every day Scott would come in and he would have hundreds of messages <laughs> because people would call up over and over again just to hear the message and then hang up. Uh, so it was a blessing and a curse. But yeah, this was a good adaptation. It was a lot of fun. Uh, sound effects were fantastic. The music was great. The acting was terrific. Uh, if you ever get a chance to check it out, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun. It was a full scale BBC uh, production, radio production, and nobody does better radio dramas in the world than the BBC. And 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 this was one of them. If you ever get a chance to hear the Judge Dredd adaptations too, they're fun. Okay, another Don Perkedge. And Don, you know, you've only written it a few times, so you don't get a, a twin spin. I don't have a picture of you. So if you want to send one along I, um, and, and, and ask questions in the future, you could get your own Don Perkedge twin spin. I don't want to cheat anybody. Okay, you've mentioned that you haven't been too pleased with some of the Punisher movie and television adaptations due to being a writer for the source material. Is there any comic material you've written where you would like to be brought in to create the movie or television versions. Also, if you were brought in, would you prefer to be the showrunner or writer? Personally, I would love to see you writing or in control of a Nightwing TV series. Uh, yeah, they would have to back a truckload of cash up to the house because I really just, I don't have any real interest in, uh, in writing for movies and TV. Uh, I know that's weird. I've been told that's weird. 
I, I've brought more than one conference call with Hollywood producers to total silence by saying, I don't want to write the screenplay. <laughs> I'll write you a treatment. I'll write you a comic book. But I don't like writing screenplays. I don't feel comfortable in the format. Uh, I don't enjoy it. And, and oh, more importantly, I don't do my best work in screenplay format. Because I don't, I love movies, I understand them, and I understand how screenplays work. It's just not my medium. I don't, the, it's too formatting, you know. Um, the little bit of screenwriting I've done has been with the understanding that uh, I'll do the writing, but you got to do the formatting. So I would write what I write. I'd write the, you know, scene descriptions and the dialogue, and then someone else would format it for me. Because I, I really hate it. Uh, and, and even in that instance, I don't believe I did my best work um, because of the, um, I, I, I constantly think about the restrictions of budget and timing and, and things like that, that, that I don't have to think about in comics. And um, uh, I don't know, it's just a more involved process and I'm not comfortable in it. And anybody that can do it well has my total admiration, but it's not for me. Now, uh, and I definitely want to, wouldn't want to be a showrunner. Oh my God, deal with all of that. Uh, it would be a nightmare. I'm a, I'm a sit alone in a room by myself kind of writer. <laughs> no, I don't belong to any writer associations or anything else. I'm the tortured loner writer, the Unabomber kind of writer. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not that I don't play well with others or I don't enjoy being with other people. And, I, and I've certainly written my share of stuff in a writer's room with lots of other people, but um, I just prefer doing it on my own. Um, now, as far as properties I have that I'd like to see turn to film, I mean, Winter World has been close to being a television series or feature a number of times. Uh, you know, maybe it'll still happen, but I'd love to see uh, my own and Jorge Zafino's vision turn into a film someday. Uh, another heartbreaker was uh, Way of the Rat. Way of the Rat was so close to being a movie. It was crazy. Uh, we had sc screenplays. Uh, we had three screenplays. Uh, the final one, uh, written by Frank Darabont, you know, Academy Award winner. Uh, Chuck Russell was going to direct. They'd scouted locations. They'd begun casting. And it was going to be done through DreamWorks and I believe Paramount. But it was up to DreamWorks <clears throat> to put the deal together. And, uh, you know, as anyone who knows the film world knows, uh, DreamWorks is run by, was run by three guys. Well, it probably still is. And uh, two of them signed off. And Steven Spielberg did not. And uh, he, you know, uh, Chuck Russell told me he literally chased him around the studios trying to get him to say yes or no to Way of the Rat. But he, he would not. Uh, he wouldn't give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And so the film didn't get made. I mean, <clears throat> it was announced at, at some film festivals, posters were made. I mean, that's how close we had, we had it. And, uh, the final screenplay was absolutely brilliant. Not to say that, you know, my comic was wonderful, the most amazing source material, but Darabont really understood and, and Chuck Russell as well. They both really understood the comic. They understood what we were going for. And the final screenplay was just just absolutely brilliant. Uh, lots of action and fun and heart and romance and, um, you know, everything about the comic just cranked up to 11. And uh, it's a shame it didn't get made. But, you know, the thing is, when you deal with Hollywood, you got to deal with producers and distributors and money people and, you know, nitwits for the most part. And, um, you know, it's amazing that any film gets made and it's a heartbreaker that better films don't get made. But, you know, you, you deal with the gatekeepers you got, right? Okay, Miller number one, who I assume is a Frank Miller fan. Could you talk a bit about the influence of Frank Miller on the Batman books in the 1990s? Was there a conscious imitation, editorial pressure, etc.? I got to say that the impact of Frank Miller's Dark Knight on the regular monthly Batman titles was zero um he was seen as sort of a dc as an anomaly a milestone a benchmark these were always special projects and they really didn't impact at all 
what we were doing in the monthly books. Uh, the monthly books were all about Denny O'Neill's vision of Batman, and I was fine with that. I, I didn't really want to write Frank Miller's uh, version of Batman. I really wanted to write Denny's, because Denny is he's the guy that saved Batman from obscurity. He saved Batman from corniness. Uh, he, he, he turned Batman back to his roots as a, a dark, shadowy, urban legend crime fighter and um, that you know that's the Batman I like that's the Batman I wanted to write and and the rest of us felt the same way uh, you know on the writing end and on the art end nobody was trying to imitate Frank Miller or do what Frank Miller was doing uh, we were doing our own thing you know because the monthly comics <clears throat> you can say what you want about the big prestige books and everything else but the monthly comics paid the bills every month you know they kept the money coming in and Batman was at this time, you know, still highly profitable for DC. Um, but I remember to tell a Frank Miller and Denny O'Neill story. I remember when we arranged uh, DC and, and Todd McFarlane agreed to do Batman Spawn crossovers, and um, uh, Todd would publish one an image, and DC would publish another one. Of course, Todd was in charge of his, and he hired Frank Miller to write it. And we were at a Bat Summit when um, the script and some of the art for it were FedExed to Denny uh, at, at our resort where we were having the summit. And um, Denny saw this image. And, and actually, this is the final image in the comic. Uh, but the initial image was drawn by Frank Miller and the, um, the Batarang was lodged point on in the middle of Spawn's skull. And... Denny, you know, uh, a bunch of us were, were with Denny at the time, and his, his reaction was visceral uh, because he felt that uh, this was kind of, a, of an F you to him from Frank Miller. Uh, that's the way Denny saw it. He said, this is a direct, you know, because it insults everything that Denny, uh, every quality that Denny had instilled in Batman, that to, to have Batman basically try to kill someone with a batarang. Um, so, you know, that was really the only connection other than one other one. Uh, when we decided to do, when we did what was ultimately the death of Oliver Queen, it began with as really the dismemberment of Oliver Queen. Um, <clears throat> he was going to lose an arm. And uh, it, we played with the idea of him losing the opposite arm <laughs> from the one that he lost uh, prior to uh, Dark Knight Returns. Uh, in Dark Knight Returns, Ali is shown as a, you know an old man with a, uh, a missing left arm, uh, so he can no longer be a bowman. And um, the, the, the wags at DC thought it would be funny, a sort of thumb in the eye of Frank Miller, a little bit of revenge for that Batarang gag uh, to have Ali lose his right arm instead of his left arm, just to show that Dark Knight was never going to be in continuity, but um, cooler heads prevailed. <laughs> but we got a few chuckles out of it anyway. Dan Donovan, you can get the license to do a comic book based on one Chuck Norris character who isn't Walker, Texas, Texas Ranger. Which one would you choose and why? Well, I wouldn't choose Walker, Texas Ranger, uh, because I didn't really like that show. I thought it was kind of tame. I, I would pick one of Chuck Norris's ass-kicking movie characters and the first one i would pick is also a texas ranger lone wolf mcquade lone wolf mcquade is like the the, the a benchmark of gonzo 80s action films it's got all the tropes it's completely wacky it's completely off the wall it's got awesome action set pieces it takes place in a sort of cartoon you know macho universe where chuck norris is just he's chuck norris it's the ultimate chuck norris movie He's undefeatable. Uh, he's, you know, invulnerable. He, 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 you know, kills men with a glance. It's, it's, it really is an, is an amazing film. It's virtually plotless, but it's still wonderful. And it gets, it, it's one of those rare 80s action films that actually gets better with age. Um, there's things to enjoy in it now. As the years go by, it, it's, it's, it's like fine wine. <laughs> 
and it has one of my favorite gags ever uh where they bury chuck norris in his dodge ram charger pickup truck his super duper truck it's my favorite cinematic vehicle of all time even more so than doc brown's delorean or mad max's uh interceptor is 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 mcquade's big ass supercharged uh dodge ram charger and, and they bury they bury mcquade in his truck they bury him alive and of course, you know, he, he comes around, he's unconscious in the cab. He comes around, he opens a beer and he pours it over his own head. And then he gets that supercharger charged up and the truck emerges from the grave. It just, it just blasts out of the grave, you know, doing like an evil Knievel jump. <laughs> and as soon as he has the door of the cab open, he, he blows away a bad guy with a shotgun. I mean, like in the next second, it's, it's my favorite action set piece. All one of my favorite action set pieces of all movies, uh, and just a lot of fun. Another great Chuck Norris character I, I wouldn't mind writing a comic book series of if I were given that choice would be uh, Eddie Cusack, the lead character in um, uh, Code of Silence, which is uh, my other favorite Chuck Norris film. It's a straight up cop drama, cop action, policier with a great cast. Um, of characters, all, you know, Chicago based characters, character actors. And, uh, it's it, another Gonzo epic. And, you know, he, he punches and kicks and shoots his way through a Colombian cocaine cartel. And, um, there's a, you know, a lot of action at the end involving a police robot. The movies is nuts. Absolutely nuts. Um, you know, and another Chuck Norris, connection for me, well, the only Chuck Norris connection for me was um, <clears throat> on Expendables, um, I guess it was three. Yeah, three. It's three, right, where, Nor where Chuck Norris shows up. Maybe it's two. I can't remember. Uh, I, I actually wrote a treatment. Yeah, it was two. I wrote a treatment for two uh, at the request of Sylvester Stallone. And uh, I wish they'd used my scene because in my scene, you know, the, in the in the film, Chuck Norris just sort of wanders into the middle of a firefight. He comes out of nowhere. He just happens to be where the Expendables are, and he helps them out of a jam by you know killing you know two hundred bad guys uh, with fifty bullets. And um, in my version, they go to seek his help, and he's a lawman uh, along the Mexican border. And when they go to his his <laughs> when they find him at his ranch, he's in the middle of a fight with about, you know, 90 cartel guys, you know, hand-to-hand -hand fight or knives or whatever. And he's just kicking their asses, but he's clearly outnumbered. And uh, I have, you know, the Expendables begin to go to help him. And Stallone says, no, no, let's see how this turns out. And they just leave Chuck Norris to finish the fight himself. I thought that was a great introduction to the character and a great nod to all of the terrific characters that Chuck Norris had played. But... As so often happens in Hollywood, they went in a different direction. Um, okay, another of my series of authors that I like. Uh, I get asked all the time, who do you read? What, what writers do you admire? Uh, Mark Bem is one, and you've probably never heard of him. I can almost guarantee that most of the people listening to this or watching this have never heard of Mark Bem. Uh, he was an American who fought in World War II in France, and he liked France so much that he just stayed. He became an expatriate and uh, became a French citizen, and he continued to write mostly in French, which is why you've never heard of him, because only four of his novels were ever translated into English. And I discovered them at uh, the Mysterious Bookstore in uh, New York City. I was, you know, hunting around for books, Probably up at, I think I was up at Marvel uh, for a summit, a Punisher summit. That's right. And uh, we had half the day off from the summit because Marvel summits weren't as intense as DC summits. Uh, you know, after lunch was over, you just sort of broke up, went your merry way. And I went down to the mysterious bookstore and I believe Stephen Grant was with me. If I And, and we were haunting bookstores uh, all around Midtown Manhattan. And uh, for some reason, I picked this up. I don't know what reason. Cover's not really that engaging. Uh, There's something about the back cover. Maybe it was on sale. Maybe it was a budget book. 
but something on the back cover intrigued me and I bought it and it contained three of them's four novels in English. Uh, Eye of the Beholder is a classic private eye story. For me, it's the last private eye story. It's the ultimate private eye story. Uh, very rarely when someone claims this is the ultimate story in the genre, is it true? But with Eye of the Beholder, it is true. And um, it's been filmed a couple of times. It's been filmed in English under the name Eye of the Beholder. Uh, it's filmed in France with uh, Isabel Hubert, I believe, or Isabella Johnny, Isabella Johnny. Uh, and it's basically about a private eye who's stalking a, uh, a black widow, a woman who marries and then kills her husband and then moves on to another guy. And uh, he's assigned to find out, uh, prove, to prove this pattern of crime. And uh, the novel goes off into uh, just a crazy place. And uh, I like Mark Bem's stripped down, terse, lean prose which is present in all of his books. Um, Queen of the Night is another one. Uh, Queen of the Night is like a grindhouse movie. Uh, you know, elevated to literature. Uh, it, it's like an Ilsa Koch uh, SS She-Wolf movie. It's, a, it's about a woman who is uh, married to the commandant of a concentration camp. And it's a it's an eerie, creepy book. This is considered his least successful novel, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's just amazing, disturbing imagery, and once again, lean, lean prose. Um, <clears throat> now, th this one on the right here is The Ice Maiden. It's, it's his vampire novel, uh, and it's very much influenced my own vampire novel, Blooded. Uh, it's, it's a current-day... Um, I, I suspect, oh man, what there's a vampire novel, a movie that Abel Ferrara made. And I, I suspect that this this novel influenced that as well, but it's it's sort of a a view of what vampires might be like if they exi really existed in, in modern society, and it's a very interesting book. Uh, and then there's Afraid to Death, which is uh, has just the simplest uh, concept ever. It, it's kind of a, a a horror novel, if written by Albert Camus, uh, a guy gets it in his head that he's being pursued by death in the shape of a uh, seductive blonde woman. And uh, he thinks he can trick death and escape it by, you know, changing his identity and constantly being on the run. And um, it's it's a really good thriller. It's, it's a weird, all of his books are slightly weird, which is the attraction. And, uh, it, you know, I just like the guy's stuff. He's a very interesting writer. There's not a whole lot known about him. He did a little bit of screenwriting. Uh, he wrote the film, uh, the Audrey Hepburn, uh, Cary Grant film, Charade. Uh, and he also wrote the screenplay for the Beatles movie, Help. Now, now there's, that's, that's a strange writing career, <clears throat> to write these noir thrillers uh, in, in a in your second, in a second language, and then contribute to a Beatles movie. Uh, I can't find anything out about how he was hired. I mean, wh wh where's the line? You know, how did he get noticed? How did he get on a film like this? But who knows? Um, but that's Mark Bem. If if you can find Mark Bem's novels, I suggest you check them out. They're very hard to find, and when you do, they're very expensive. But uh, it's worth the hunt. Jerry Bingham the great artist, Jerry Bingham, sociopath protagonist, living crime to crime, ultimately taking on the mob and winning. Have you ever read anywhere that Westlake might have been inspired by Patricia Highsmith when he came up with the Parker series, Color Me Uninformed? Uh, yeah, I spoke about Patricia Highsmith uh, in an earlier video about how she wrote about sociopaths and psychopaths. She wrote about criminals. Her novels, for, for the most part, were, were about crime. They weren't who done it or police detective novels. They were, you know, crime. Uh, Donald Westlake wrote in the same genre. Uh, <clears throat> you know, he wrote a lot about criminals. Uh, you know, some detective fiction, but mostly from the point of view of the criminal. Now, I know from, from reading interviews with Westlake that uh, he created Parker. The inspiration for Parker, you know, came out of his love of gold medal 
paperbacks. Uh, he wanted to be a gold medal paperback writer, and uh, gold medal had a, they were a uh, sort of a, I, they weren't sleazy, it wasn't grindhouse fiction, it was, it, it, it was muscular it was for the most part muscular men's fiction uh and and generally well written who whoever the editors and managers and publishers of gold medal they were people of taste they didn't accept just you know exploitation crap uh they tried to elevate these books above the pulp and westlake's aspiration was to be a regular gold medal novelist because he admired the work they were doing and um his inspiration for Parker, which to his mind was the ultimate gold medal character, <clears throat> it came from a long walk he took. Um, apparently, he wound, he lived in Manhattan, but he wound up in Brooklyn one night with no money to take the L home and had to walk across Brooklyn Bridge in the middle of the night in the middle of a rainstorm. And uh, it's a creepy experience, uh, you know, that long walkway across the river uh and it was cold and damp and windy and miserable and on his way across the bridge he began to think to himself what kind of character what kind of person would be at home here because he certainly didn't feel at home he couldn't wait to get off the bridge and off the streets and get back to his apartment but he began to wonder you know what kind of person would be at home here and that's when parker was created parker his classic um professional thief professional criminal character and um you know it's in a lot of ways like the high smith ripley character uh except ripley was you know more refined more of a charmer had a personality uh parker really doesn't have a personality parker is more animal he's more brutal he's more strictly a survivor than anything else and um in in all of the novels by Stark, Richard Stark, which was the name that Westlake wrote under, wrote Parker under, um, you know, each one of these is, is a high story in which uh, Parker has been sc screwed out of the take or in some way betrayed uh, or, or trapped. You know, he's, he's in jeopardy. These are, these are um, deconstructed plot lines where everything goes wrong, but Parker emerges um, triumphant in the end uh you know yeah i mean without a doubt westlake read patricia highsmith but the writer's works are you know quite dissimilar and and parker was writing for a different audience than highsmith was um highsmith was writing for the general you know like readers of alfred hitchcock uh alfred hitchcock's mystery magazine She's, she's writing for that kind of an audience. And she had pretensions to literature. And, and I believe her stuff was literature. It's, it's extremely well written. But equally, I think Westlake and, and, and his Richard Stark persona were, were also literature in their way. I mean, you simply can't find better crime fiction than anything that Westlake wrote under, under any name that he wrote under. It's just top drawer, excellent uh, escapist crime fiction. So that's it for this week. Um, if you could, if you might, if you must, <laughs> check out my Patreon account under the name Arcave and Comics. Uh, it's Arcave and Comics, but it's really the Chuck Dixon Slush Fund. Uh, in just a few weeks, in just a very short amount of time, we're going to be launching ArcTunes, which is a digital uh, comics platform that's going to have dozens and dozens of new properties. Uh, it's going to print, uh, it's going to, it's going to be a free digital comics platform you can read on any device and it, uh, will feature a number of series I've already completed. I've never seen the light of day. They've they're completed, they're ready. And then I'm working on four different ongoing series, uh, all of which you've never seen. And, uh, these are all being prepared and I'm working with some, you know, top flight artists, but, uh, the Patreon account is how I pay them. If, if so, if you join up, there's some perks, there's different levels, you know, a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, whatever. And, um, it gets you in the ground floor, it brings you in on this, you know, uh, free service where, uh, we're doing some exciting stuff. We're going to have uh, a, a, a whole lot of brand new material 
that you can read on your phone or, or you know, pad device or your, you know, desktop. And uh, high resolution, excellent artwork, all the rest of it. So if you go there and uh, join up, you will have my undying gratitude. Hey, that's it for this week. See you next Wednesday morning and uh, see you all down the road.